Hello YouTube, it's been far too long since I last made a video, but as the world heads towards its end, I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't add my voice to the cacophony of opinion pieces and video logs out here on the internet. Truly, the events and uh, political situation of this past year are without historical precedent, but they certainly have historical antecedents. I wanted to focus this video on the proliferation of dangerous conspiracy theories involving COVID-19 and explain why I think it is that they are so prevalent and the role that social media has in propagating anti-science sentiment in general. This video is not a debunking video. You can find those for yourself elsewhere. Or better yet, read the peer-reviewed scientific literature yourself through sites like Google Scholar, ResearchGate, and SciHub. So firstly, let's go back, way back. I remember back in the day when YouTube first launched. I was convinced that the internet and social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube, which dispense with the gatekeeping of traditional media outlets, would encourage critical and independent thinking and would no longer be beholden to the opinions and wishes of a media machine controlled by billionaire oligarchs. I thought that the unfiltered dissemination of information would lead inexorably to a new enlightenment in a free and open marketplace of ideas. What a naive fool I was. I failed to account for the fact that these platforms are not independent arbiters of opinion, but are in truth profit maximizers which thrive off controversy and sensationalism. It should come as no surprise that the videos, comments, and ideas which proliferate on the internet do not necessarily do so because of their truthfulness or because of their genuine utility, but simply because they are good at replicating. In earlier videos on this channel, I've mentioned the concept of meme theory, first introduced by Richard Dawkins in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, and later expounded upon by Susan Blackmore in 1999. Essentially, the theory suggests that ideas and other cultural artefacts behave in a way analogous to biological evolution, in that wherever there is a group of heterogeneous individuals which have the ability to replicate with some variation and some heredity, wherein there is a selection pressure applied, those individuals will tend towards being more suited to their environments. From the perspective of genes, it matters not what the consequences are for the individual life forms which are constituted by them, but only for the success of that gene. For example, evolution has programmed worker bees to protect the hive at all costs, because that is the route to their genetic reproductive success, even if it is at the expense of the individual bee. So how does this tie into the proliferation of conspiracy theories in general? Well, it indicates to us that in a similar way to genes, the ideas which proliferate are not necessarily the ideas which are best suited to the individual or carry any advantage to the individual, but they are simply the ideas which are the better replicators. So which ideas are those which are most likely to spread? In biological evolution, we can think of selection pressures as being those things in the environment which influence the reproductive success of certain genetic traits. Unlike biological evolution, ideas and cultural artifacts need human agents to spread them. So we can think of selection pressures in mimetic evolution as having two distinct aspects. Firstly, there is the biological aspects, ideas which more readily tap into pre-existing biological predispositions tend to do very well indeed. What do I mean by this? Generally speaking in this context, I mean sensationalism, fear, and that feeling of righteous indignation. These feelings elicit in us such a powerful emotional response that we often commit what Kahneman and Tversky call the substitution bias. Rather than thinking carefully and critically about the information that has been presented to us, we instead substitute the difficult question, how likely is this to be true, with the much easier question, what if this was true? And then we ignore the fact that this unconscious substitution has taken place. This is a cognitive heuristic which is thought to be part of an effort reduction framework in order for humans to reduce the cognitive load of ever-increasing complexity within the political sphere. As well as innate biological predispositions, the environment which ideas spread is also a cultural one containing a myriad of competing assumptions and beliefs. 
Some ideas reinforce each other, whereas others stand in contradiction. For example, it would be extremely unlikely for a person who believed the Earth was 6,000 years old to also believe the theory of evolution by natural selection. A belief system is often intricately entangled, whereby the rejection of one particular assumption would almost certainly lead to other related beliefs being questioned. A person's entire personal philosophy can be thought of as resembling tapestry. Each belief intricately interwoven, with each strand reinforcing and strengthening the other, to create one coherent whole. But should just a single thread unravel, interconnected pieces also lose their strength, become detached from the whole, and all of a sudden the coherence of previous pattern is torn apart. Some concepts depend on each other, and some necessitate others. The environment which these ideas proliferate is also itself constitutive of ideas. It's pure ideology. The psychological processes I've described so far provide us with part of the explanation, but they do not well explain why this phenomenon is growing in today's socio-political climate. What is the role of social media in facilitating the spread of conspiracy? As many on either end of the political spectrum will tell you, often angrily, social media companies are not simply a neutral public platform, like some kind of idealised Greco-Roman debate forum, but they are themselves controlled and maintained by individuals whose interests are not always our own. They offer us a distorted mirror rather than a true reflection. Many of us who've been on using the internet for a while may remember the original web page, and we also remember the birth of what was then called Web 2.0. The internet was social, interactable, writable and rewritable, commentable, shareable, creatable and recreatable. But this optimistic utopia was not to be, and personalization came at a great cost. In The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Shijan Azubov highlights with great clarity the modus operandi of social media companies. In exchange for personalization, we have entered a Faustian bargain in which we willingly hand over a whole host of intimate details about ourselves, our names, our hobbies, our birthdays, jobs, location, treasured memories, subconscious actions, and so on, in order that we might have content which is more appealing to us, make us engage with the social media platforms even more, and in turn hand over yet more data, which can be subsequently used for machine learning algorithms to make predictions about our future behavior. It is these behavioural predictions which are the true commodity of the social media and surveillance capitalist giants. These predictions are made with an ever-increasing degree of accuracy and ever-increasing in scale and scope. Predictions sold to the highest bidder, which is usually an advertiser hoping you'll buy their product or service, or whatever else they might happen to be selling. Given that the economic model of social media giants depends as a raw resource upon human data, it is unsurprising that engagement is maximised at all costs. Social media giants require the constant extraction of human data, and they foster addiction as a means to this end. But unlike other addictions, this one carefully monitors and learns from your behaviour in order to make it even more appealing to you. And what causes more engagement than controversy? Shares, debates, arguments and counter-arguments, and the fewer is tapping in the comment section. These all enable further extraction of human data. The controversy sells, which is why they are so prolific on these platforms. Sometimes news outlets run sort stories which I suspect are only there to inflame their own readership, like taking a baseball bat to a bee's nest because you were worried they were ignoring you. With everybody now able to have their own platform, there is somewhat of an assumed parity of opinion. Experience, knowledge, and credentials be damned. Somebody said it in a video and it seemed authoritative, so what do the scientists know I couldn't figure out myself? For the record, I do think that there is an interesting discussion to be had around appeals to authority, be those legitimate authorities or not, but needless to say, it's a good rule of thumb to believe the expert over the layman in matters relating to the expert's actual area of expertise. And when we're dealing with factual, empirical claims, the credibility of the source matters, even for the simple reason that the scientist if a scientist is known to be deceptive, underhanded, or fraudulent, their entire career will be in jeopardy. But not so for the Facebook commenter. 
But it is not simply the case that the modern conspiracy theorist is anti-intellectual, it's not that they reject any and all evidence and expertise, it's far more insidious. They have their experts, their data, their studies, no matter how fringe, incredible, or entirely irrelevant. Given that between a quarter and a third of Americans believe that COVID-19 was planned, it shouldn't be entirely surprising that a tiny fraction of the 1.1 million US doctors um, have also, among them, conspiratorial beliefs. But it would be a mistake to hold these people up as representing any sort of medical consensus when the evidence to the contrary is so overwhelming. When you feel like the world is difficult to make sense of and your views are not taken seriously, the idea of secret knowledge can be very appealing. And when faced with contrary evidence, the temptation is to double down on your ignorance with the hope to retain this feeling of being informed in a world of ignorance. It would be naive to think that there are no conspiracies. Watergate happened after all, but one thing that I have noticed is how often these conspiracies revolve around the idea of a puppet master. It's clear that often this has other implications which are beyond the scope of this video, but I believe that there is also an innate psychological tendency to attribute intentionality towards significant yet difficult to comprehend events, and a human hand directing unforeseen events is an explanation which is always going to be psychologically appealing. The truth is that in the world is a complicated place, and societal problems are often caused by complex interplays of different competing factions and contingent historical conditions, not people making sordid deals in dark rooms to best decide how to deceive people. But the appeal remains nonetheless. I think it plays into the psychological tendency of the intentional stance described by Daniel Dennett, which is a level of abstraction where we view observable behaviours as explainable in terms of the mental properties of conscious agents. Is there systemic and structural inequality? No, it's just George Soros. Is there an impending climate emergency brought about by an economic model which externalises environmental costs? No, Greta Thunberg is just lying. I'm afraid to say that some of our own governments have added fuel to the conspiratorial bonfire by downplaying the severity of the outbreak during the early stages, contradicting international experts and acting out of political self-interest rather than the interests of the people they're supposed to represent. Both here in the UK and the United States, the elected government officials have confused the message and contradicted themselves on numerous occasions, which feeds into the general feeling that we cannot trust the official advice on COVID-19. The one thing I will say in favour of conspiracy theorists is that part of their concern is that they are being lied to. And they are right, but for entirely the wrong reasons. I find it quite confusing that the so-called libertarians who are are concerned about draconian government measures and see the anti-mask movement as a rejection of the totalitarian regime, are also typically the same people who support the governments of the USA and the UK respectively, but then I suppose consistency is never a trait of conspiracy theorists. Finally, I wanted to briefly comment on the link between conspiratorial beliefs and a growing openly fascist movement. Fascists are often preoccupied with the idea of a secret plot to bring down Western culture, so it's unsurprising that the fascists are using the recent wave of COVID conspiracy as a recruitment tool. In the UK, for example, recent anti-lockdown protests have also included people waving flags which are explicitly Nazi, like this Werwolf insignia, a reference to a Nazi plot to create a resistance force behind enemy lines, or this flag which comes from the British Union of Fascists during the interwar period. I think there is a cause for deep concern about the growing prevalence of conspiracy. I think we have a duty to point out obvious factual inaccuracies where we find them, but I fear that this alone is not enough. It's not enough to debate each conspiracy as it comes on a point-by-point -point basis. The conspiratorial-minded will have already jumped onto the next scandal before you've even finished making your point. We must delve deeper. We must look at what causes this type of magical thinking to arise, persist and propagate. Only then will we have a chance to combat the anti-science sentiment before it manages to take root.